Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another video with Mr. Kenton with HO Chemistry, and we are moving along in topic one, which is on stoichiometric relationships. And so we introduced in the last video, we talked about electrolytes and how to calculate concentration of individual ions in a solution. Well, now we're going to switch that into essentially solution stoichiometry. And guess what, guys? This is the last video for this topic. So once we're done with this, we're going to then kind of make a shift towards a new topic. So we're going to be moving towards atomic structure and electron configuration. So that's exciting. But before I get ahead of myself, let's focus in where we are right now. So kind of the goal from what we're going to be looking at today is how do we approach problems where we're given concentrations amounts of solute, volumes of solution, how can we solve problems that use those components and use that to find information as it pertains to another substance within a chemical process? All right, that's where we're going to be going. So let's go ahead and dive right in, guys. So if you recall, a solution is a type of homogeneous mixture. Right, so solution, homogeneous mixture, those terms can be used interchangeably. And remember, this is a physical combining of two substances, right, of two pure substances. And your, your mixture includes your solvent and your solute. And if you're not remembering those terms, you're in luck. We're still going to look at them. We're going to define them again, right? So our solute is our substance that's being dissolved in our solvent. Right. And so like when you're making a solution, like when you guys <clears throat> have been in class before, um, like when you're making a sodium hydroxide solution, your solute is generally the solid sodium hydroxide. Right. It's being dissolved into your solvent and it's usually the less abundant component. Right. Now, your solvent that's the substance that's doing the dissolving. And so, for example, when you guys made a solution of sodium hydroxide, your solute was the solid sodium hydroxide pellets, but your solvent was the water, right? That's the thing that was doing the dissolving. And so when we start to talk about solvents, and specifically when we're talking about solution stoichiometry, we're usually using a liquid as our component as our solvent. Now, remember, there are solutions that exist where you can have solvents that are gases or that, that are solids. It's not saying that liquids are the only types of solvents, but in our context, in the, the scope of solution stoichiometry, almost exclusively what we're dealing with is a, li is a liquid. And when we really break, down, break it down, when we're talking about aqueous solutions, our, our solvent is water right? Water is a good solvent. It's able to dissolve a lot of different things, specifically our ionic compounds, and allow for solutions to form so that you can do aqueous reactions pretty easily. Now, your solutes, they can be solids, they can be liquids or gases. Um, and again, within the scope of aqueous reactions, your solvent is generally a liquid, right? So in you know, obviously solid solutes like sodium hydroxide, you could have liquid solutes. For example, if you're talking about maybe a mixture of an alcohol of some kind that you're placing in water. So now you've got a solution. And with gases, like if you're talking about hydrogen chloride gas, as soon as you place that in water, that's how you get hydrochloric acid. So just some, some general things about making solutions that we need to make sure that we're reminded of and we're keeping track of as we're moving forward. Now, let's take a look at an example of how we would go about solving a problem where we're dealing with solutions and their quantities and what we can do. So let's imagine that you're asked to calculate the mass of copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate, so CuSO4, Remember, it's that big dot 5H2O, required to prepare 500 centimeters cubed of a 0.4 mole per decimeter cubed solution. So again, 
Gotta love our IB units, centimeters cubed and decimeters cubed, right? But essentially, this is, essentially it's just a regular stoichiometry problem, except what we've been given is we've been given concentrations and volumes, right? And so we just have to understand how do we use those pieces of information to get the information that we want, right? Now they're asking us for mass, and so we should know right off the bat, oh, in order for me to figure this out, I'm going to need to figure out moles of my substance first, right? So because they're asking us for mass, we got to solve for moles. And when you look at this particular equation, you've got a, a concentration and you've got a volume. Well, we know that if we take that concentration and multiply it by the volume, we're going to get the moles of that particular substance. So let's do that, right? So um, we can multiply the volume by the concentration, and that's going to give us our moles. Now here, of course, notice that we have centimeters cubed versus decimeters cubed. So we're going to make sure that we convert that centimeters cubed into decimeters cubed so our units cancel. So to get our moles, we've got 500 centimeters cubed. We set up our dimensional analysis. We're going to multiply that by one decimeter cubed over 1,000 centimeters cubed. That's going to take us into decimeters cubed. And then we multiply that by the 0 0.400 moles per decimeter cubed. And we find that within that volume of solution, we have 0 0.200 moles of copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate. Well, now that we have the moles of copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate, we can then convert that to mass and figure out how many grams of that copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate are in our solution. Right, so we just need to multiply by the molar mass and then we've got this taken care of. So 0.2 times 249.61 grams per mole. And so that means that 49.9 gram of copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate were required to make that volume of solution with that concentration. Okay. I hope that makes sense. And if I went through that too fast, just rewatch the video, rewatch this particular section, and kind of follow on and think through is what Mr. Kenton's saying, is that making sense? I think it does, but if you need to do that, feel free to do so. All right, now I would say this is a simpler example because you're only working within the confines of one substance, right? So they gave us the, the, molar, the molarity and the volume of copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate, and they asked us to figure out something else as it pertained to copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate. Well, what do we do if we've got a, a chemical reaction and we need to figure out, we're given some information about one quantity, we know one thing about this unknown that we're trying to figure out, how do we go through in, in the process of figuring out other information about this other thing that's being produced? Well, hopefully, when you think about that question, hopefully what your mind gets drawn to is the fact that we can do titrations, right? And again, titrations are not necessarily just acid and base reactions. It's really a technique that chemists use. What they're doing is they're taking the concentration of a solution, trying to determine the concentration of a solution by referencing it to a standard solution. So that can be done with any type of solution, whether it's an acid base, whether it's a redox reaction, it doesn't matter. Like if we can experimentally do this, we can figure out the concentration of of an unknown substance by comparing it to a standard solution of another. And so let's dive into titrations, right? So if you remember, standard solutions are used to find concentrations of other solutions. So for example, when you guys did an acid-based titration in AP chemistry, what happened, you were given a standard solution of sodium hydroxide. It had a known concentration value, right? And you were tasked with you were given an unknown sample of hydrochloric acid, right? It had an unknown concentration. You didn't know what it was. And so what you had to do is you used the sodium hydroxide to neutralize the acid and figure out, okay, this many milliliters of base was used. It had this concentration. It neutralized this amount of acid. How many moles of acid did I just neutralize? And from there, I could figure out the molarity or my concentration of my acid, right? And so this volumetric technique, titration, is most commonly used to find the concentration of an unknown solution. Matches up very nicely with what I was just describing 
in an acid-base titration. Now, what does that look like? How would a problem that has to deal with titration, what would that look like? Let's take a look at that now. So let's say here's your scenario. It says what volume of two um, molar hydrochloric acid would have to be added to 25 centimeters cubed of 0.5 molar sodium carbonate solution to produce a neutral solution of sodium chloride. Okay, so there's a lot of information there, right? If you look at that particular question, we see that we're given the concentration of the hydrochloric acid, we're given the volume of the sodium carbonate solution, and we're given the concentration of the sodium carbonate solution. And so anytime we're dealing with a titration or stoichiometry, remember it always has to go back to, we need a balanced equation first. So the, our first task is can we produce a balanced equation for how this reaction is going to take place? And so what we can see here is we've got hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium carbonate to make sodium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide gas. And so now that we have our balanced equation, we can then take the pieces of given information that are given in the problem and use that to figure out how we're going to start. Now, in this particular case, when you look at your givens, you're going to notice that you've been given two pieces of information as it pertains to the sodium carbonate. And so as a result, that means that you can find the moles of sodium carbonate. And when you're looking at a titration, typically the thing that you have two pieces of given information for, that's what you're going to start with. And you're always going to want to get to moles. So we're going to find moles of sodium carbonate by taking the concentration and multiplying it by its volume. And again, watching out for our units. So we got our 25 centimeters cubed, cubic centimeters times one cubic decimeter divided by 1,000 cubic centimeters times the concentration of sodium carbonate. And we get that we would have 0.0125 moles of sodium carbonate. Now, once we find the moles of sodium carbonate, we can go through and we can use the mole ratio from the balanced equation to get us into um, units of hydrochloric acid, which is what they're asking us to, to solve for, the volume of it. So use the mole ratio to find the moles of HCl needed. So we're going to take that 0.0125 moles, and we're going to multiply it by 2 over 1. So we find that we're going to need 0 0.0250 moles of hydrochloric acid in order to neutralize 0 0.0125 moles of Na2CO3. So now we've got the, the moles of HCl, and notice that they gave us the molarity of hydrochloric acid, so then our next step is simply going to be using the concentration of hydrochloric acid to find the volume. So we're going to divide the moles by the volume by the molarity to figure out the volume. Right? And so once we plug that in, we've got 0 0.0250 moles divided by 2 moles per, per decimeter cubed. And they specifically, I mean, they don't mention that they want it in centimeters cubed, but you can take it to cubic centimeters. But what we find is you've got 0 0.0125 cubic decimeters. And if you convert that to cubic centimeters, that's 12.5 centimeters cubed or 12.5 milliliters. So we need 12.5 milliliters of hydrochloric acid that has that concentration to neutralize that volume of sodium carbonate with that concentration of 0.5 molar. I hope that makes sense. And so I just want to take a look at one more example problem, and then we'll be done with this particular unit. And I think the last one's going to be fun. It's going to be the most fun that we've looked at thus far. So hope you're ready, right? So let's say you're asked to calculate the volume of carbon dioxide produced at STP when one gram of calcium carbonate reacts with 25 cubic centimeters of two molar hydrochloric acid. All right. Well, we want to figure out the volume of carbon dioxide produced. And we've been told we've got one gram of calcium carbonate, and we've got this volume of this concentration of hydrochloric acid. So now I'm looking at this, and I'm in my mind, I'm starting to think, wait a minute. This isn't just a titration problem. This is a limiting reactant problem. Oh, man, that's exciting. You guys know what that means. 
we got quite a bit of work that we got to do, right? And so, you know, first we get our balanced equation. Like we know there's going to be a lot of work ahead of us, but we get our balanced equation. We got calcium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid produces calcium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. So we got our balanced equation. Now, like I mentioned, this is a limiting re reactant problem, but even better, they give us mixed units. So we got all sorts of different conversions we're going to be working with. We're going to take the information we got from gases. We're going to have to use that here um, so we can figure out how much carbon dioxide we have. And so we need to take both of the givens and get those to moles. So with the, the grams of calcium carbonate, that's going to be taking the, the molar, dividing by the molar mass to get to moles. So you got one gram of calcium carbonate divided by the molar mass of 100.09. So 0.0100 moles of calcium carbonate is given. All right, to get to the moles of hydrochloric acid, we're going to need to multiply the molarity of hydrochloric acid by the volume. So 25 cubic centimeters times one cubic decimeter divided by 1,000 cubic centimeters times two moles per one decimeter cubed. So we got 0.0500 moles of HCl that are present. That's what's given, right? That's what we've got. And so then what we want to figure out is, okay, we can use our limiting reactant kind of methodology. We take the amount of calcium carbonate given and look at how much hydrochloric acid do we need. So we need 0 0.0200 moles of HCl to react with that much calcium carbonate. Well, we've got 0 0.05 moles, so it looks like we're good to go there. But then when we look at the hydrochloric acid, we've got 0 0.05 moles. We need 0 0.025 moles of calcium carbonate. Well, unfortunately, we only have 0 0.01 moles. So that means that calcium carbonate is our limiting reactant. All right. That's exciting. So now that we've identified our limiting reactant, we can then go through and calculate, all right, how much carbon dioxide can we, can we actually produce from this reaction? Again, if I'm going too fast, pause the video, rewatch it, do what you need to do so that you're making sure you're tracking along with me here. And so we're going to need 0 0.025 moles of calcium carbonate, but we only have 0 0.01, so that's our limiting reactant. So we then take that to amount of carbon dioxide using the mole ratio. So we see that it's one to one. So we got 0 0.0100 moles of carbon dioxide that was produced. And if I'm not mistaken, they asked for the volume of carbon dioxide. So we're going to need to use that 22.4 cubic decimeters per mole to get us into volume. So we get 0 0.01 times 22.4 to get 0.224 cubic decimeters. And then if you want to get that into something like cubic centimeters, just multiply by 1,000, and we find that it's 224 milliliters of carbon dioxide is what's going to be produced from that particular chemical reaction. All right. Oh, yeah. I can tell now you guys are really going to like this. So much fun, right? So that's the last thing that we have to cover here are just some citations because, again, I didn't make this PowerPoint. Um, a lot of this is coming from our textbook. And, um, you know, the person who made it, they did the best they could to try and adapt it to the HL Chem book that we're using. And um, that's what I'm using. Just want to make sure I'm citing my sources so that I can't get hit with some copyright crazy stuff. So um, thank you guys for watching this video. That is the end of Unit 1. So excited that you guys were able to join me on this journey as we were looking through stoichiometric relationships. Can't wait to see you guys again real soon. Take care.